All right, we're going to start studying the spine in detail today. A little bit of this is going to be review because we did get introduced to kind of just the basics of the spine. Uh, but like when we started diving deep into the shoulder complex and the scapula and we really look at the joints in more detail and the bony landmarks in more detail and what's palpable and how it relates to massage, that's kind of the deep dive we're going to start to take tonight today. Uh, the spine is complex and beautiful, and um, this is kind of a cool sculpture of the spine. Um, I won't really get into the details of, of, of what this, this uh, sculpture is doing today, but we'll get into that another day. So uh, there's a saying that you're as young or as old as the flexibility of your spine. Um, I mean, obviously this is problematic in some regards. Uh, it's able-bodyist and it is uh, limiting, right? Folks can have uh, different uh, mobilities in their body and still be healthy, right? And folks can be, uh, you know, that, that's a whole study in and of itself that I hope to spend more uh, time with. Um, but in general, right, uh, good flexibility in the spine is, is your center uh, from which movement is possible. So movement in the spine is, is helpful, but there can be all kind of limitations in movement like uh, scoliosis and uh, other issues where of course folks can still be uh, healthy with limitations in their spine. And uh, you know, this, this pose also makes me think of uh, yoga and I'm also very happy to share really awesome yoga teachers who are not able bodyist in their thinking and who teach uh, folks how to do yoga, no matter how flexible or not flexible they are, no matter what injuries they are, no matter what size they are, uh, which is uh, sadly rare for the yoga community. So we can get into that later if you like. In fact, <laughs> there's some good courses coming up. Yeah. Yeah. But hanging from trees, that sure looks like fun. I want to go climb trees today. So uh, uh, this, this page does get into, you know, some concepts that are important even for your treatment planning. So like if you are doing, um, you know, the, the spine or other areas in your body can, can limit activities that you both love to do, but they can also activity, limit activities that you need to do. And so if a client is coming to you with insurance-based massage, we need to work with them on their treatment goals based on what's called activities of daily living. So they may like wanna be training for a marathon or climbing trees or whatever, but if it's an insurance-based massage, you're gonna to wanna to make sure the goals are focused around activities of daily living. And that could include you know, all the care that's required to take care of themselves and their families. And so that might be things like even being able to brush your hair or take a shower or, um, you know, take care of your kids, make meals, etc. cetera. Um, yes. I just have never thought about this before, but. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll answer my own question. I just hit it inside my head. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> you bet. You bet. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, uh, it's good. Uh, you'll be observing your client's movements, right, uh, from the moment that they walk in, you know, and are they stiff, limited in motion? Um, are they in pain, right? So a lot of what we see, and this is a word that you should know, is antalgic gait. Um, and it's just a fancy word. To say antalgic, uh, usually it's said as gait. It's a fancy word for basically like, is the person moving uh, with guarding of their pain? And in case you can't see that, like limping and stuff like that, it could be as extreme as limping. Yes. I'm writing it in the uh, chat right now just for spelling. It could be limping. It could also be just sort of any guarding pattern. So like if they're in pain and they're kind of uh, hunched over because of the pain, as massage therapists, we want to pay attention to notice what is being held stiff and what is moving because a lot of what we can help with 
is these compensation patterns, right? So if somebody is guarding somewhere, what else is uh, having to sort of uh, compensate or do more movement because of the areas that are guarded? Also, walking with a guarded pattern makes 100% sense at the acute and subacute stages and when the client is in pain and when the tissues are damaged. But what can often happen is that those patterns can be set into long-term and even permanent patterns. And that's part of what the Traeger guest was talking about with different words, right? So we're gonna see a lot of folks where their sort of limitations in motion are from really old stuff that is now sometimes just set in their fascia and is sometimes set in their nervous system and doesn't necessarily serve them uh, how it once served them. Now, if there's still physiological damage and issues in that tissue, it might still be serving them. But if those tissues are more healed over and they're now just guarding right from an old injury, what used to be painful, they can get progressively less and less and less and less mobile. And this can happen anywhere in the body, but the spine is a great time to start looking at it. So this gentleman over here on the left, right? Actually, all three of these seniors, you know, we see this pattern a lot with the elderly. Uh, it can happen with younger people as well, um, but uh, sometimes this just becomes from a lifetime of each of these sort of injuries and traumas, us responding with more and more protection and less and less movement. Yeah, just bring up questions, comments. So it's in the intelligent, intelligent gate. Yeah, the intelligent gate, that, what that literally uh, is referring to is that guarded movement pattern. Okay. So if you see a client coming in and they're like protecting themselves and then you want to pay attention to what all is not moving because of that. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, Anna and then Taylor. So have you ever seen um, through different therapies somebody who is um, displaying this nomtalgic gait kind of bent over like that? Sorry. I have to leave it on because of it's talking to our owl. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Have you ever seen them be able to recover? From, I mean, depending upon the degree, the angle, but have you seen that get corrected with massage and various therapies, physical therapy and so on? Yeah, it can often get a lot better. Um, you know, part of it, of course, depends on how old the person is, how set the patterns are, and, and how, how damaged is the tissue. So, you know, this gentleman over here might have a harder time, right, than uh, somebody younger. But um, there's also this difference that I'm going to also write in the chat between a functional um, uh, postural issue and a structural one. And so the difference between, uh, and this relates to your question, Anna, mm -hmm. um, functional versus structural. And so um, what you can have, for example, is, you know, the functional is kind of more like how the soft tissues are responding versus if something occurs over a long period of time, the changes can actually occur in the bones themselves. And we'll see this with scoliosis, we'll see this with kyphosis. So there could be like a short-term kyphosis, like say a 20 year old who slouches when looking at their phone, and that is usually functional and they can usually correct it if they so make the changes. But say that person is then doing that for 10, 20, 30 years, their bones will literally change shape. And so we are gonna study the spine in detail. And these bodies of the vertebra uh, are right now, I'll make one really big from the side they're kind of, the bodies are kind of like this. That's kind of from the side. 
And if there's a really long time pattern of a kyphosis or a scoliosis or a hyperlordosis, over time, this can literally become a wedge shaped or triangle shaped. And at that point, it's a structural issue and you're not gonna be able to make changes in the same way as if it was just the soft tissues. You can still help them oftentimes with the pain and even some degree of mobility, uh, but, not, but not that. And I, and I would guess that this gentleman over here has probably had this condition long enough that there's changes in his bones as well. Yep. Oh, sorry, I forgot you were in line. Uh, so with the entropic gate, is that specifically uh, referring to validating patterns in the walking? Or like I said, you kind of like hold the shoulder and stuff. Would that be included? Yeah, great question. So with the antalgic gait, so the word gait, of course, implies the movement of walking, uh, but it can include any of the guarding patterns related to it. So you will see, you'll see people guarding all the way up into the movement of their arms and pecs and shoulders. And so that can be included in it. Yeah. I noticed that a lot of people sit, you know, how they... Yep. Sit like this sometimes. Yep. 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 And they think that it's okay or something. Yep. Um, and and it can feel easier in the body, right? But it really actually isn't, right? And it's training the muscles and so forth to, and the connective tissue to be all responding differently. And yeah, it can kind of set in that pattern over time. Yeah. There's also one I want to call out that I don't know if it's been called out in any of your stress readings and videos yet. Um, I can pull up a video, not right at the second, because I don't want to uh, take time finding a good one. Uh, but, you know, I'm talking about this kind of guarding against injuries kind of pattern. But of course, people do the same thing against stress and trauma as well. And there's some, you know, interesting uh, studies too, where if if you make a loud sound behind a human, and they'll often do this with like a gunshot sound, everybody has the same response in their body, you know, and the way we move our, our head and neck and the way everything, yeah, that startle response, right? Uh, but then a lot of us kind of freeze that startle response, <laughs> uh, you know, for understandable reasons, right? We're in unsafe and traumatic environments in ongoing ways, right? So people can get frozen in that startle response. Yeah. Well, there can also be like energetic imprints, like almost like memories mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. on more subtle levels. Smells and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. And we'll talk about that more too when we get to like more directly our trauma unit, but yeah, for sure. And, and, and like, that's why I like to think about like, even if a injury started as purely a physical injury, it's never just a physical injury, right? So let's say somebody had a, even a shoulder injury that was just, a, I can't think of one that has zero traumatic you run into origin. The, you know, hit your shoulder into the door. Okay. And let's say it's bad enough that either it gets dislocated or for some reason there's soft tissue damage or it breaks or whatever. Let's say it's bad enough that the person's activity of daily living is now interrupted. So whatever their require, like whatever their role is in the family, whatever their responsibilities are, if those are disrupted, right, their ability to earn an income, the ability to help take care of the family the way that they usually do, you know, whatever their responsibilities are, this now, right, becomes a much bigger issue and all that other stuff gets layered in on it, right? And so, yeah, then it becomes like all that's kind of imprinted in the body as well. And the person has to process all that. It's pretty yep. weird. Well, sometimes like with the energetic it stuff, you in time. It, it almost, seems like there's like a snapshot taken or something mm. and in like a freeze frame of that occurrence 
whether that is something that actually happens over time or something that happens in like a, a trauma in a moment, it's like the body takes a snapshot of it in a way. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, an imprint. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot like that. And, you know, that part of the discussion may sound a little abstract or hard to believe or whatever, but I think the more you do massage and the more you receive massage, you'll have these experiences of like people really kind of deeply keeping these feelings in their bodies and then they sort of process them with massage. So like you could have, for example, you're massaging somebody's knee and they had an injury like 30 years ago. ACL injury. And all of a sudden they're like, you know, really experiencing all the sort of emotions and everything around what they were processing because of that injury. And I've had the experience as a client and as a therapist many, many times that experiencing in a client centered kind of safe massage environment is a great way for somebody to somatically experience these things mm -hmm. and then move on from them in a way that they were kind of before those snapshots, right, were sort of frozen there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Traeger guy talked about it, right, but lots of massage modalities are capable of that, even Swedish massage, right, the getting into that deeply relaxed state and working with the person. Kind of made it seem like, like the massaging was just like rubbing on the muscle and it was like yeah that's good and all but I mean it seemed like it was not really helpful or something and that's completely 100 percent not true right yeah. like any massage modality done from a, a client-centered space right can yeah. have these super profound impact because when you were massaging client. me you a while ago you were pushing on my esg down there yeah and i felt it all the way down my leg and uh -huh. i was like this is certainly useful yeah you just gotta know what the heck you're doing yeah 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 for sure anna well besides that healing modality which is taking place on both conscious and subconscious planes at all times like any form of touch therapy it's like going through all these layers of the person and subconscious is like the iceberg with two thirds of it underwater type of thing, you know, and so there's all this relationship happening on all these other levels. levels. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, you know, that this is coming up right for kinesiology of the spine on many levels, but one reason is because, you know, what is the spine protecting? In this, it's a the little nerve. rubber model. You're very close. The, the upper part does, yeah. The nerve in uh, the, the um, yeah, I the 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 I don't know what it's called. Uh, yeah, life source, something. Veins. Not yeah, arteries. veins, arteries, and and what runs all the way through this tunnel, all the way up and down, is the spinal cord, spinal cord. directly connecting to the brain. So this is like our highway of information to and from the brain. And then out of all the sides are the nerve roots, right? So this is our key, you know, it's, it's protecting that and we're moving from that, but, you know, this is all deeply connected to our, our spine our, and our nervous system. So, all right. So, you know, this is kind of just walking us through, right? Some, some clients are going to be kind of lethargic and tired a lot. Um, Obviously, there's many reasons for that, you know, and uh, not to simplify this, uh, but but sometimes it is uh, related to the spine and, and the muscles thereof. It could be uh, anemia and, and all kinds of other issues as well, depression. Um, so I, I don't want to simplify it as if it's always a muscular thing. Um, but being able to understand and work with the spine is, is going to be really crucial. Uh, for your massage practice, and I'm excited to dive deep here. So taking a look at the anatomy of the spine, um, let's first kind of take the sort of 10,000 foot view or like kind of the up in the sky plane view, looking down at the main structures. Uh, we have um, the spinal column, which is the bones and discs. 
and the neural elements, the spinal cord and the nerve roots, and then the supporting structures like the muscles and ligaments. And so we will look at, you know, all, all of those aspects. Uh, it's important to look at, right, what are the important functions of the spine? And when we talk about the spine, by the way, we are talking about, you know, we're usually talking about focusing on these, these bony, you know, these bony elements. Um, and it, it protects the spinal cord, you know, as we talked about. And of course, you could see like the extreme uh, version of when the spine cannot protect the spinal cord, you know, would result in paralysis, right? Somebody from wherever, if their spinal cord was severed and, and damaged because the spine couldn't protect it, from wherever it was, if it was damaged that badly, from wherever it was damaged that badly, from that point down, the person, you know, would be um, paralyzed. Um, so depending on where it is. So like, that's how, how important it is that our spine can protect our spinal cord. It serves as leverage uh, for the muscles to provide movement right on our central part of our body. And it, you know, it needs to be flexible in that. And it's, it's kind of a, it's a fascinating design, you know, very similar to a, a snake spine where we have all these small individual segments that stack together like super, super intricate, unique Legos. They're not all like matching Legos and uh, to provide all these uh, movements, right? They can twist and bend and flex to the side and forward and backward and, and much more even than this model because this model has had to uh, stabilize the spine in a, in a way that's different in our body. And it also helps stabilize the thoracic area and protect the internal organs. So I don't know if you check this out, uh, but this, this link has a kind of a neat model that you can kind of click through the layers of the, the muscles. Uh, but for now, we're going to start focusing on the vertebra. And this part, you know, uh, part of this is, is, is going to be review, but again, we're going to go deeper. So there's three sections of vertebra in the spine. And the vertebra, right, refer to these individual uh, bones in the spine. So the three sections, starting from the top down, we start cervical, neck, there's seven. Then moving down, thoracic, in the torso where the ribs attach are 12. And then in the low back, lumbar, five. And <clears throat> these are abbreviated C for cervical, T for thoracic, and L for lumbar. And people to memorize how many are in each sometimes think seven, 12, and five, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That may help you. It may not because people eat at different times, but for some reason, people <laughs> remember the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I mentioned this before, but just to make sure we don't miss anything, we count these vertebra from the top down, starting with the number one for each section and then start at number one again for the next section. So we go from the top, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, then T1, we start again at one at thoracic, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 12. And then in lumbar, we start back again at one, top down, two, three, four, five. So C1, C2, et cetera. Some of the vertebra, Actually, the first two, C1 and C2, have special names and you should know them. And we will look at the detailed version, uh, detailed structures of each of the vertebra. But from the top down, C1 is the atlas and C2 is the axis. And they're super specialized. C1, the atlas, looks like a ring or a disc, very different than the others. 
And C2 has this projection that sticks up into C1, and that's the axis. So the atlas and axis are very unique, but they are also cervical vertebra. And we will look at all the vertebra in detail in a moment. Now in the spine, you know, we also talk about this, uh, the fused bones of the sacrum, right? The big triangular uh, sacrum that we've already been massaging, right? And then the coccyx uh, or tailbone below or inferior to the sacrum. And we don't massage the coccyx because it's so close to the anus, but it can get a little dislocated. And so, you know, sometimes chiropractors might work with it. All right, we're going to use a PowerPoint too, but uh, as these walk us through kind of like little bits of information at a time, we're gonna, we're gonna go through these critical concept pages. So there's, cur there cur there's curves in the spine. It's not, it's not straight, uh, but have curves. So to clarify, if you're looking at the spine from the front or the back, you know, it should be straight. It's from the side, that the curves should be there. So we should have curves from the side. And what those curves do is like a spring or a coil, they allow for more flexibility and the absorbing of you know, impact. And so um, I've read that that makes the spine about 10 times stronger than it would be if it didn't have curves. So these curves from the side, if we look at the side curves, first of all, they should be there. I wanna make that perfectly clear because we later on talk about when there's too much curve, but the curve should be there. So from the top down, and you can see these in the, in the big spine as well as color coded in the uh, diagram of the person. And I'm gonna put this spine in the same direction as the one in the diagram. So the, in the cervical area, the curve should go forward. And in the thoracic area, the curve should go backwards. And then in the lumbar area, the curve should go forward. And then in the sacral area, the curve goes backwards. And there's two different ways to name these curves. And the one, I'm gonna first go with the one that's used less and explain why. Um, in, in a fetus, the curves all face the front. And because that's the curvature we have first or initially, it's, those are called primary curves. But then when we start crawling and walking, we develop these other curves. And so any curve you know, that goes backwards is called a, a secondary curve. But what we more often talk about, you know, is, is the name of the curve in, in that area. And, and the ones that gets the most attention are this thoracic curve and the, chi, uh, the lordotic curve. So the thoracic curve in the th thoracic area, and then the lumbar curve in the lumbar area. And I think the reason we talk about those curves the most is because those two tend to uh, become excessive or too much, right? So then we talk about hyperkyphosis. That's too much curvature in the thoracic area. And shorthand, people call that kyphosis. Technically, you should say hyperkyphosis, but people will say kyphosis, too much curve in the thoracic area. That comes with that hunched over, right? Which again could be functional just, you know, kind of curving your spine or it could become structural if the bones and so forth are actually changing shape. Same thing in the lumbar area, you know, uh, it often just gets called lordosis, um, which refers to too much curvature in the, the lumbar area. Yes. Do you mind writing this on the board? I don't mind. I'll put it in the chat too. 
So I'm going to write the shorter version of the word, which is what you see more often is uh, lordhyphosis and lordosis. And you're going to see those on your licensing exam for sure. Those are very common. So I'll write it in the chat too. So the, the kyphosis is too much curvature, excessive curvature in the thoracic area. And you could say hyperkyphosis. And uh, lordosis is too much curve in the lumbar area. Yes. And Professor, you said that uh, you understand about cervical spine, and you said it's um, like uh, forward. It, yep. You said it's secondary. What do you mean secondary? Yeah. Um, so let's take a look at this picture of a fetus or a, a baby mm -hmm. and see how all the curves go forward. Mm -hmm. So, any, those are called primary curves because we have them first as a baby and then any of the curves that go opposite from that direction are secondary because we don't form them until we start crawling and walking mm -hmm. thank you yep and that term doesn't come up as much as the others but it, it comes up often enough that you should know it uh questions so far uh, so yep uh, in cervical spine yep have, like, uh, uh it can be called a lordotic curve, but usually lordosis refers to the lumbar spine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a little confusing. Kyphosis is almost always talking about the, the curve in the thoracic area, and lordosis is usually referring to the curve in the lumbar area. But technically, you can refer to curves in those directions as kyphotic or lordotic, but almost always you're talking about thoracic and lumbar okay. for those. Yeah, it's a little confusing, but that's what how people usually define them. And, and they would normally call it by the area of the spine. So they would say like a cervical curve rather than calling it the direction of it. Yes. So for the cerv cervical vertebrae section, that would be considered a lordotic curvature? Uh, technically, but you don't hear that very often, but yes. Okay. Yes. Anna. Um, so when you're working on folks like this um, that come in for massage, are you, well, if they're not addressing it, are you suggesting PT um, for any chance? And then also, do you give any exercises or stretches for them to take home? Yeah, um, we, we can do both. And we're going to do a lot of work with fascia, myofascial release, trigger points, and uh, postural assessment. And at that point, you know, we'll we'll focus more like you know where we can address the functional parts of the pattern, like where we can stretch and lengthen the fascia, and where we can uh, have them activate their muscles. And yes, we can give them some exercises for that. Yes, we can refer to PT and OT. Yeah. And a lot of times, this is an important point, and thanks for asking your question. You know, a lot of times folks will come to us because of their pain and or stiffness and limitation, more so than saying, hey, I've got bad posture, right? So, but you will be able to see like where they're saying they're in pain and where they have limited motion how it's related to their posture. And you can work with them on that, right? Now, some of your folks will come aware of and interested in working on their posture and their core muscles and so forth, but oftentimes they're coming to you because of pain and limitation and so forth, or injuries, right? Like, you know, they come in with some low back pain. They're not usually saying I have too much curve in my low back, right? But you can see, with their low back pain when they have an anterior pelvic tilt and when they have too much curvature, right? And addressing kind of the pattern more holistically. Yep. Maybe even very rarely 
take the medication could add to this. For example, my life experience is I was on high dose steroids for four and a half years. Yeah. And I had a serious medical condition going on. And um, it really deformed my body. Um, in more of a immediate sense, it was I grabbed that well, bison hump on the back of my neck. Uh -huh. And then um, it started reshaping my thoracic area, which uh -huh. to this day, my neck and my thoracic area, there's been a, like a car accident or two in there and stuff like that too, but are not shaped the same and they're thicker. And there is probably hyperkyphosis in my thoracic area. It's also extremely stiff and it's always doing me pain. But it started with the steroids. Like the steroids just knocked me out. Yeah. And long term corticosteroid use can really. Uh, uh damage the uh connective tissues mm -hmm. so that's not uncommon with long-term corticosteroid use mm -hmm. now if somebody's using it for a shorter term problem like acne or something that doesn't tend to um, have the same mm -hmm. impact and so here's a very simplistic drawing of three spinal conditions that in second quarter, when we do specific treatment planning, we will dive into deeper, but that these three you should, should for sure know and for sure will come up on your licensing exam. So when there's a curvature off the mid sagittal plane, it's scoliosis. And we're gonna dive into this much deeper later in treatment planning, but I find it fascinating that once you deviate off of the mid sagittal plane, the way the spine works, it is physically impossible for it to just go sideways. So they will also rotate. And what happens is called rotoscoliosis, even though people usually just call it scoliosis. But what's attached in the thoracic area to these vertebra? Ribs. So if these start rotating in addition to getting moved off laterally the entire rib cage rotates and gets squished on one side expanded on one side part of it opens up more and so it can really have major impact on the person's breathing and moving and all kinds of things is scoliosis similar to radiculopathy what is that uh, radiculopathy is more about the nerve pain, and I think uh, it can occur in different areas. Now with scoliosis, when you do start having major rotations and lateral uh, movement, um, you can have these nerve roots compressed and painful, so you can have it with it. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, just a tiny thing to go back to tiny bit. So with the kyphosis or the lordosis, um, yep. it sounds like it might be really beneficial to do some myofascial release. Is that right? Yes, for sure. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Would could this also happen if somebody was tensing too often because of trauma? Yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, very, very commonly. Yeah, because we have that. We have that startle response um, and then, you know, a lot of holding patterns um, for all different types of trauma uh, can definitely result in that for sure. And you see that with lots and lots and lots of your clients and it, a lot of changing in breathing patterns, right, which also uh, can for sure be part of that pattern. Yeah. And so you'll see lots and lots and lots of clients in chronic pain. And chronic pain can be complex. Um, it can often be related to trauma. Uh, there can be then layered in trauma, physiological responses, and then all of the kind of social emotional uh, responses as well. And kind of what I just barely scratched the surface on part of what comes into play for folks is if they can't do their activities of daily living the way that helps sustain themselves and their family 
of course that can have huge impact, right? If they can't be, you know, doing their jobs, earning money, holding their houses, taking care of themselves and family and so forth. So, um, and you're gonna see this a lot in your practice. And we're just scratching the surface today. We'll have trauma experts come in. We'll kind of dig into this a little bit um, deeper later. That's like a really great point about changing the breathing because you think of trauma as certainly affecting breathing, but like you think of it like from a really structural sense, even too. Obviously, like if someone's leg becomes rolled over or protected um, in a very physical, functional sense, as well as mental, emotional, and other realm, um, all of that changes the breathing. Yep. But I didn't really think about the physical bone structure, all of that. Yeah, and that tends to change more like uh, I was given the example of scoliosis. A lot of your clients will have mild scoliosis, which doesn't tend to change the rib shape as much as moderate or severe scoliosis is when, again, we'll look at better PowerPoints and treatments and so forth, but um, it can really kind of compress and, and rotate the whole um, and a very dear friend of mine had very severe scoliosis and uh, actually taught yoga for scoliosis. Um, and uh, yeah, was taken from this earth much too young and her uh, breathing patterns and impact on all of her organs were part of it, though it was uh, uh, intestinal cancer that took her um, Younger than me, she was a birthday sister. We lost her a few years ago. So the kyphosis, the slump, shoulders. Lots of folks have the kyphosis, uh, excuse me, the lordosis, excessive curvature in the lumbar area. Um, but in pregnancy, uh, certainly can be challenging for the low back. And so this uh, person's pants line, uh, pants line is, is kind of showing us a good angle. Uh, and so it's kind of easier to see that, that we have a bigger curve here in the low back. And so it's very common to have a, a, a bigger anterior pelvic tilt <clears throat> in pregnancy. Um, and that of course, it, it puts a big strain on, on the, the body. splitting of the abdominal line. Yeah, we'll talk about pregnancy as a whole unit, right? And pregnancy okay. massage, yeah. But that is also very common that between the rectus abdominis, that can muscle can get split. It happened to me. Um, yeah, and uh, we have other folks saying it happened to them as well. Yeah, so a lot, lot of things are common in pregnancy. And then we have our scoliosis, which we already talked about. So let us move on. Do they still check scoliosis in school? When I was a kid growing up, the girls had to go in the girls' locker room, which type of thing they separate. I, I think they do, yeah, still check it was for it. It a weird um, thing. I think the reason they check for it uh, in schools, uh, well, I mean, of course, there could be lots of reasons, but, but basically it often has an onset of um, young teenagers or preteens and it can be a sudden onset and it's idiopathic to most of it's idiopathic do you guys remember what that means you don't know where it came from yeah yeah but <clears throat> still don't know why, why where scoliosis comes from mostly mostly wow yeah and i've already taken this statement apart as problematic and able bodyist um so we're mm -hmm. we're going to move on from that well, so I don't get on a really long soapbox tirade. All right, so we talked about this and this. We're gonna move on, I think, to the details of the spine now. We got these curvatures already. All right, so now let's, we're, we're gonna start to get into the, uh, the details of these vertebra. And each section of the spine has some similarities and some differences. People typically start with the thoracic area because they say it's kind of the more sort of has the more standard features, but 
each sec each section of the spine has some differences. So I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with it's sort of the standard, but we will start there anyway. So in the top left, uh, and I'm going to hold up some thoracic vertebra now. Uh, people often talk about the thoracic vertebra as sort of looking like giraffes, whether you look at the giraffes from the front or the sides. Mm. And part of the reason that the thoracic vertebra look like giraffes is because the spinal process are what's called shingled. So they go facing down and layer on top of each other. And in this diagram on the right, when you see them stacked on top of each other, you can see how those point downwards. And if you look at a large spine, right, or even your smaller models, you know, you can take a look in the thoracic area and see how they're kind of uh, shingled on top of one another and how that's different than in the other way. And that's the spinous processes. And I don't know how quickly I can go between the view that zooms in on that and for our folks at home, but I will I have more control of our owl now. Okay. Yes. I can they lay on top okay. of each other. Like that. Uh, thank you. Professor, yes. Is it just another form Woo. of protection, like dinosaur? It reminds me of a dinosaur, but the spine, how it pokes out. Uh huh. It's just another way to protect those nerves and stuff. Otherwise, it could be flat, right? Why does it poke out in the back? Usually when there's pokey outy places is for muscles to attach. So we have this beautiful intricate structure of parts sticking out to the side and parts sticking out to the back. And we're gonna see how different muscles attach and go into those spaces. That makes sense. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful. Folks at home, I zoomed in as much as I can on our large model. And uh, if I spin it around, you can see hopefully in the thoracic area how there's kind of an overlay of those vertebra and or if I take these ones right here, let's see if I can get there. And you can see how they lay over each other, the spinous processes. All right, so reset to autofocus. Hey, look at that. I have a little bit of control over the owl. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the features. And at this point, you could use the handouts to follow along with me and label them as we go, rather than label them after. Uh, these pictures are also in your trail guide. You could also draw them on your own, uh, but you'll wanna be paying attention to all these features I'm calling out, some of which will be attachment sites for muscles. So here on the bottom left, we're looking at a view of this vertebra uh, as if we were looking from the top or the bottom. So here's you know, a side view. And then if we were flipping it up like this, looking at it from the top or the bottom. So what sticks out in the back is called a spinous process. And all but the top, cervicals have that. What sticks out on the side, like a T, is called a transverse process. The big thick part that supports the uh, vertebra above and below it is called the body. And if we take a look at the picture on the right, it's this big part right here are the bodies. And that's the part that stacks up on top of each other for support. And then between the bodies and the transverse processes and so forth, there's these little um, things called pedicles, uh, which basically just help form this arch. So we end up forming this circle and that's what the spinal column goes in. So if we just take one vertebra at a time, it's a hole, right? But if we take a bunch of those vertebra on top of each other and we stack them, it becomes a tunnel. 
And that tunnel is what the spine old column goes through. I guess you're just looking at me like this right now, owl. So there's our tunnel. <laughs> I'm talking to an owl. Okay. Thank you for making it look like an owl. I feel a little less crazy. <laughs> or maybe more crazy. Uh, questions so far? Okay. Yes. Are there conditions? Um, I think I've heard about where people sometimes think it's like a trauma together. Mm -hmm. or it shouldn't be. Like I know the safe room is used, but other ones should be, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. And that actually is a nice segue. Uh, the question, you know, is like, do these sometimes get fused and they shouldn't be? And yes, that's that's true. And that's a nice segue to the next landmarks we're going to look at are how these um, vertebra uh, articulate with each other. And that's the fancy way of like, what are the joints between them? So here they're like fancy Legos. This one, they've been shaded in blue and blue. Mm -hmm. We take these Legos and we stack them on each other like this. And there's these joints right here are called facet joints, or people might say facet joints. Both are correct. And each vertebral segment, different areas on the spine, the facet joints kind of face different directions and it's useful to look at a spine and see what directions they face. But here in the thoracic area, I'm, I'm a thoracic vertebra right now. And my upper facet joints face like this and they're gonna talk to the thoracic vertebra or articulate with the thoracic vertebra above me. And then I also have facet joints down below and they're gonna articulate with the thoracic vertebra below me. So they're holding hands. And there's one to hold hands with the vertebra above it. And there's ones to hold hands with the vertebra below it. So those are all facet joints. And each one allows little movements, but stacked all together, they can make bigger movements. And which direction those hands face determine and how they articulate, determine which type of movement is most possible in each section. So you can take a look at the lumbar vertebra. The hands are facing this way instead of this way. And that means we don't have so much side to side rotation movement there. So it's protecting it from moving too much in that direction. New question? I think I was just confused because I was looking at the worksheet and trying to make it congruent with what's up there. And but this is a lumbar. Yeah, you can only look at thoracic so far, my friend. Okay. Stay with me because okay, each well, vertebra is different. Yeah, that's what I was like. Am I on the right thing? Because there's they are similar looking. They're different too. I know they're different. That's what I'm saying. Good <laughs> job noticing that. Stay with me. <laughs> All right, so the thoracic vertebra have a specialty feature. What articulates with the thoracic vertebra that does not happen anywhere else? Ribs, beautiful. Because the ribs articulate there, we need joints. So here we have facet joints uh, for the ribs to attach. So fascinating, I think. Uh, the rib attaches both to the body and to the transverse process. So it curves in like this and it fits in like that. Very cool, right? Super cool design. So it, it fits in like that. Yeah, my thumb was designed for that. It's made for it. All right, so another cool thing. Right, they kind of have different features, whether we look at them individually or stack them. When we stack them, they do something else cool. They not only make a tunnel for the spinal column, they also make these hole, holes between them. And if we look at a model like so, even though this is lumbar vertebra, they do the same thing. Uh, our spinal, uh, our uh, spinal nerves 
come out in the holes between them. And those are called intervertebral foramen. A foramen is a hole and inter is between the vertebra. So when you stack these vertebrae together, they make holes for the spine to come out between the sides like so. A lot of cool features here, right? Yeah. Yeah. But notice that the intervertebral foramen end up being behind, or excuse me, anterior to the transverse processes. So that is not palpable. We can palpate in this area here, but not in that area. This is super, super deep because it's very protected, right? We want it very protected. So that brings up kind of one more important landmark that is very relevant to massage. You're gonna hear it all the time and I do not see it labeled here. So I'm gonna label it. If we were to go this ski slope between the spinous process and the transverse process, this here is called the lamina groove. And it's full of muscle that we can palpate that's important to us. And it's important to chiropractors. So in red now, I'm gonna highlight, we can palpate spinous process, we can palpate transverse process, and we can palpate the lamina groove. So this is a massage zone. Oh, well, there's no nerves there? The nerves are in front of it. Wow, look at that. That's yep. the part where you, you can get in with your elbow, right? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And, and we are going to now start studying the layers of muscles Ooh. in here, right? So far, we've been just looking at the superficial erector spinae group. But now we're going to get to like what actually lives in this lamina groove. And as a little preview, you know, this is a major focus of chiropractic work is uh, little subluxations or my, it's the subluxation is sort of a basically like a very, very minor dislocation. It's like partially out of whack. So they're dealing with the little subluxations in these facet joints. Uh, but our deepest muscles in the lamina groove if we relax those in the erector spinae, that helps it so they don't just go right back out of place. So that lamina groove muscle, the rotatories and multifidi are important. That's why you get a massage and then you see your chiropractor. Yep, yep, that's why the, they work really well together. That and also really that discussion forum and chapter and movie uh, that that uh, we were supposed to work on this week for, you know, why is stress reduction the foundation for all treatments? Uh, that, that's really key too, right? We want to get folks into parasympathetic mode and then also work with these soft tissues and neural connections, right? Because if the body's in a sympathetic panic state, right, we can't really do all this other beautiful work in the same way. All right, so that is, let me make sure I didn't miss any features of our lovely thoracic vertebra. You, yep. You said we were supposed to work on that, or do you mean, oh, at home though? Uh, what? Yeah, we're supposed to work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. yep, 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 yep. The only one I didn't cover here is between the bodies is where we have our intervertebral discs. And we will take a, a closer look at those. So those are just not attached, but they're just sitting in there because they can become herniated somehow? They are actually attached. Uh, this is a model of one that's become herniated. And we'll talk about the details of that shortly. Is yep. that tendon, right? It is made of the same, well, it's uh, made of a very similar material. Yeah, let, we'll get into that very shortly. Love that you guys are thinking. A disc. So that, yep, it is a disc. Yep, cartilaginous disc. So that's our lovely thoracic vertebra. Now we're going to talk about cervical vertebra. And how many of them are there? Seven, beautiful. And the first two are very specialized. So let's actually look at a typical cervical vertebra first. 
And then we'll back up and look at the specialized ones. So you can see some different features already on a regular cervical vertebra. So we've got in the transverse processes, we have these holes and they're called foramen, transverse foramen. And within those holes travel uh, arteries. So again, if you, if you look at just one, right, it's just a hole, but if you stack them together, they become a tunnel. This little feature is not really palpable and not as clinically relevant, but some of them have a bifid spinous process, bifid for two. So some of them kind of split into a V uh like this one but that's not always palpable i mean it's never palpable that's and it's not always there like axis. here's here's some other cervical vertebra that don't have bifid processes but it's the sort of question that might come up on an exam uh, when you're just differentiating features but what's more important for the feature difference really is this transverse foramen because it's clinically relevant that you have these arteries. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's important to not move the head and neck around too much in a, in a massage, right? That if somebody's had some auto accident histories, which most people have, um, sometimes they have some unresolved issues where you really don't want to kink up the neck in a way where if they're feeling lightheaded, dizzy, nerve sensations, right? That could be something, right? We don't want to mess with. So, and we don't want to kink up uh, this tunnel, right? That has arteries traveling through it. Uh, otherwise, we're looking at the same type of features. You know, we've got our spinous process. We've uh, out the back posterior. We got our transverse processes out the sides. Uh, you can see that it, it's pretty broad here, and this is palpable. We'll actually massage some muscles where part of it attaches to the anterior aspect of the transverse process, and part of it attaches to the posterior aspect of the transverse process. And this is palpable. Yes. So uh, the body is on the anterior side of yep. the body. But yep. It's the posterior side of the spinous process. Uh, no, because there's a gap between it. You're correct that it's on the front anterior, but it's not really the posterior side of the spinous process because there's this tunnel. Okay. And this arch, so it's further in front of it. Well, because it seemed like it was like flip flopped, like when you say it was on the anterior side, but the spinous process is on the anterior side, but that's the posterior side of the body. It is posterior. Yeah. It's on the back. Um, and that's the part we can palpate. Right when you feel on the back of someone's neck, it's the bumps in the back. Yep, Anna. I think I'm having a little, little like not fully processing this either. But okay. The, so the spinous process you said we cannot palpate, but how? Was no, that? we can. Oh, for some reason I thought you said. The, no. So what I drew the, on the last the spinous process. We oh just we can't feel that it's split oh okay so sorry okay. if that was confusing yeah. we can palpate the spinous process just like anywhere okay but it just doesn't feel split like that okay but we can palpate it just like anywhere so just like the thoracic vertebra we oops that went crazy we have a lamb and a groove here that we can palpate and we can palpate our spinous process and we can palpate our transverse process uh, but we cannot palpate any of this stuff is too anterior. How do you palpate the transverse process? Like, you... It takes more palpation skill. So we're going to do it in lab, not just sitting around touching each other. 
but in the cervical area, it's way out to the side. So with flat fingers, if you go forward and back, but don't press where you feel a pulse. If you feel a pulse, move backwards. Uh, but it's a big bump on the side. But especially sitting up, there's a lot of tight muscles, so it's harder to feel. So we'll have a sit down lab and get very familiar with the neck. Just for a visual cue, is it near levator scapula or like muscles that we know? What does levator scapula originate Our, on? Um, or, um, originate? Yeah, what does it originate on? The scapula? Uh, that's the uh, insertion. Oh, oh, up, uh, up here. The, um, the, what is it? One, two, three, four. Yeah. What part of one, two, three, four? Transverse process. Transverse process. Mm -hmm. So a levator right? scapula originates on the transverse process of oh, yeah, one, two, three, that. four. So yes. So yes. Yep. That, so if you follow it all the way up, that's what you're palpating. You're making connections. That's good. Weakest. And, and this is the axis we're looking at now, right? No, I started with the typical cervical vertebra because C1 oh. and C2 are specialized. So we're going to back up to that in one second. Uh, I know. I think I was kind of just like in La La Land on the thoracic. I, like, you be they picture it different than anyway. it is right yeah. on the slide. And so I just was like trying to orient myself. So I feel like I lost some of the learning. I'm just saying that. OK. Uh, well, we're not done. so. We can catch catch you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all part of the learning. Um, when you figure out what you're kind of not catching and what you're catching wrong. So here's a cervical vertebra, and my finger, my thumb right now is going to hold the spinous process so that you can see the body. And here's a thoracic vertebra, and here's the body. So you could see that the Thoracic vertebra has a much bigger body, right? Yeah. And the spine supports itself on the bodies. So as we move down, the bodies get bigger. So here's a lumbar body. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> oh, yeah, Did you say the thoracic is the giraffe one? Yep, look at here's it a giraffe. Like a giraffe. Thoracic is a giraffe. This one takes a little more imagination. Like People say a moose. That could say moose. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And I don't. People don't usually attribute an animal to this one. Um. Okay. So a fox. Fox. Cool. What's that? Is the spinal fluid, the amount of it vary in between the cer um, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar just because of how thick they are? Yeah, good question. Uh, so we'll come back to the uh, intervertebral, um, uh, and, and we'll look at the fluid in there when we come and look at those. But, but uh basically yes as we move down the spine we have more weight and pressure so we have a lot of pressure on the lumbar vertebra and those intervertebral discs can get compressed and that we tend to have the hernias more in the lumbar area and that that fluid can get squished out more did that answer your question your follow-up question yes thank you uh-huh you're welcome Okay, so now that, that was a basic cervical spine. We're now going to look at the two very specialized ones. So C1 and C2 have very special designs. You should know their names. You should know their designs. So C1, the atlas, this is the one that the brain sits directly, or not the brain, excuse me, the skull sits directly on top of. And as you can see, it has a ring-like design. That is the body. No body, good observation. So it's super unique, there's no body. C1 has no body. Is that for the uh, spinal cord to go through? 
quite possibly, but also because of this net, uh, well, oh, yeah. it, it's more mobile. Again. So our big uh, movements are, are C1, C2. So C2 has this dense or odontide process that sticks up. That's the side view. Odontide. Top view. That dens right here has two names. Um, uh, let me see how quickly I can get to the chat. So um, the dens on C2, well, C2's very specialized feature is the dens, which is also the odontoid process. Can you all see that? Is that too small? I can see it. Okay, cool. Okay. So the dense or odontoid process of C2 fits into the ring of C1. And this allows for very big rotational movement or pivot movement. So our big, our biggest pivot left and right is from C1, C2 but all of the cervical vertebra all rotate, mm. right? So they're all rotating, but then we have a really big rotation possible between C1 and C2. Yep. So cervical has the most rotation thoracic has also some rotation and then the one that has the least rotation. Yes, yep, yep. Also in general, the cervical has the most movement overall mm -hmm. and the lumbar has the least movement overall. We want the most stability in the lumbar. Yep. All right. So that's our C1, C2 atlas axis. And, and I think there's some Greek mythology there, right, in the name. So I think atlas, uh, I don't know everything about the character, but I think that was the one with kind of the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, if you're wanting to think about that, it's the one holding the head. So the skull will sit directly on that. The occiput? Yes. Uh-huh. I um our, our skull model. Or is it the sphenoidus? Uh like the bone inside of your it's spine. not the sphenoid. Okay, so here's our atlas. Sorry for the it's hard to drive. Uh, here's our atlas. And so again, we've got these articular facets. Uh, the, those facet joints are just articulation points. They're in blue indicative of like a slippery uh, articular um, tissue. And then our C2, you know, our main thing there is our dens or our odontide process. And we do not have bodies, right? And then we have still these transverse foramen. C1 and C2 don't have bodies. That's right. That's right. And C1 also doesn't really have a spinous process either. Sometimes when you talk about like your suboccipitals, People will use the shorthand of still talking about that as an attachment point, but it, it's not it's not really the spinous process on that one. So that's our cervicals. Uh, any questions about cervicals before we do our last ones, which are lumbar? Okay, cool. So last but not least are lumbar and they don't have too much specialized about them. Oh, actually let's take a look at this great drawing. I mentioned that the transverse foramen, right, those holes when you stack them on top of each other make a great tunnel. So here's our vertebral artery traveling through them. We don't wanna kink that up. That's the garden hose you do not wanna kink up. All right, last but not least lumbar vertebra are moose. So here's our side view of our moose. And as I showed you by comparison, holding them up next to each other, uh, the one of the distinguishing features of a lumbar vertebra, which is here, this one, 
is that it has a very big body. And that's because it's got to support the weight of everything above it. So we want a nice, thick, strong body. And again, just to orient ourselves, right? The spinous process is posterior or back and the body is anterior or front and is crazy, 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 crazy deep. You cannot palpate that unless you're a surgeon cutting open the front of the body, sticking your hands in the body. This is deep to all kinds of stuff. Abdominal organs and all kinds of stuff. So other than that, we're looking at, sorry, folks, a uh, very similar, right? We've got our spinous process on the back, very palpable. We can feel these points in the back. Transverse processes on the side, bodies in the front. Pedicles are these pedicle ped for feet are kind of these sort of feet or base that connect the body to the, um, the arch of the transverse process and spinous process. And together that makes the vertebral foramen or the big hole that the spinal cord goes through. And again, if we're looking at just one, it's a hole, but if we stack them together, right, it's a tunnel. Yep. Is the body referring to like that entire piece or just kind of the flat surface where the vertebra are supported? Uh, great question. It refers to this whole, this whole thing is the body. Okay. Yeah. And there's, there's no hole in it. That's just to, um, for models mm -hmm. to, to put a post through them. And this body is where uh, our discs are gonna be sitting on between them, right? So we'll look at our, our discs pretty soon here. Now, all of our vertebra need to have articular facets, right? They have to be able to articulate with the vertebra above them and articulate with the vertebral above, below them. So here we have our superior articular facet. So the one that's gonna connect with the one above it. And then we have one below it connecting the one with below it. So we have our superior, superior articular facet and an inferior articular facet. And then of course here we have our lamina groove and we've got our rotatories and our multifidi living in the lamina groove and we're gonna palpate and massage that deep because we're gonna be that good. Questions, comments? So the body, that interior part does sink in. Does that flush or does it, it looks like it sinks in in the middle of the body? It does a little bit higher on the outside than the inside. Yeah, but we've got the, that's the attachment point for the intervertebral disc. Good like, observation. Like a scallop. Scallop. Like, it, like how it attaches. Like it, it's flush with that, like the infra super is, it just like attaches to the whole thing there. I don't know how a scallop attaches, but it's a scallop. quite possibly. It's a sea creature that's like lives inside of the shell. So here we're looking at, right, a bigger one, and you can kind of see, right, our bodies uh, on the anterior aspect of our lumbar vertebra, you know, big with our intervertebral discs between them. And just like all the vertebra, when you stack them up on the sides, we have these intervertebral foramen where the spinal cord comes out of. But that is anterior to our TVPs, so it's not really palpable. Yeah, questions? Yep. So besides general movement and exercise, is there anything for the spine to keep correct curvature and everything else, like just some really great in particular type of movements or exercise? Lying on the ground. Um, well, things that are good for um, the fascia and muscles, keeping our postural muscles in balance. So, and that and, and including working with our core muscles. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, folks tend to have too short and tight right in the front, mm -hmm. whether it's the fascia as well as the pec major, pec minor. 
And then we want to have our rhomboids and our traps strong in the back. And yeah, exercises, stretches, yep. Laying on a towel rolled up on the spine with arms back can be a good one. You're talking about laying it across, was it across the thoracic or in or also the lower? Rolling, rolling it up in alignment with your spine oh, yeah. and laying on it is something that you can even do for your clients on the table. It's a very gentle way to help encourage them in a gentle opening movement. Because most of us are too forward. Mm -hmm. Most of us need more opening. You can do that as well. But the one I was talking about was rolling up a towel lengthwise and having it literally under the spine the whole way, mm -hmm. which is very gentle opening this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does feel really good to lay on an exercise ball or a roll on your thoracic area. Yeah. Open that with your arms way out. All those kind of opening, right? And, you know, cobra and, you know, those kind of things. Yep. Could so we here use we have. Bolster? Yep. Could we use the bolster to put it under? The yep. Yep. Uh, now, some of our bolsters are kind of too big, though but they sell bolsters in a lot of different sizes. And so a lot of massage therapists will get like little wedges and things to really kind of like, if there's a rotation in the hips to kind of support with a small wedge. Um, so if you had like a smaller one, you could, but ours are pretty big for that activity. Okay. Which is why I said, just roll up a towel so that you don't have to buy bolsters in lots of sizes. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. So our sacrum and our coccyx, we don't actually need to know as many of the names of, you know, the various surfaces. Uh, but just to kind of point out that we do have some fused vertebra here. Uh, so it is one solid bone now. Um, there's these uh, five segments and it's a big triangle. Uh, but again, we don't actually need to know all of the names. Uh, we do, you know, we've got our set joint to articulate with L5. And we've got these uh, holes for, our, uh, for uh, nerves, the sacral foramen. Um, they're not very palpable. We've got a lot of muscle and fascia on top of that. Sometimes you can sort of tell there's a little divot on this one, uh, but not so much. And then our coccyx, again, we don't massage there because it's so close to the anus, but we have, you know, uh, it, it is a palpable, uh, uh, it is a palpable bone, but it's too close to the anus. And, and those are uh, 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 fused vertebra or, or fused bones as well. Yep. Is the right picture the posterior view of this? Or? Yeah, great question. And otherwise it's not labeled and confusing. It might be labeled if I scroll. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the posterior view has like more of a raised aspect in the middle and the anterior view kind of curves more forward. And of course, the anterior, this is all not palpable, right? That's super protected and deep, uh, but this is all palpable. And of course, as massage therapists, we started this in like our, our uh, second unit that, you know, we really work uh, a lot on this border, which, you know, gluteus, gluteal muscles attach there, and also the piriformis. Um, and then there's also muscles right on it and fascia. So we work right on it, uh, as well as right above it. Yep. Yep. Well, even though we don't massage the, the coccyx, is that a place we would put the hot dog? Just above it, great question. Okay. So when, when we use hot packs, hot stones, Himalayan stones, uh, most people love it on the sacrum. Uh, but again, getting way down to the coccyx is just super close to the anus. Um, but people do get uh, dislocations in their coccyx. And um, you could see like with this model, uh, this is a birth canal, right? So if if this is dislocated, 
uh, people often fall, like if they fall on their butts funny and it hurts a lot, they often kind of uh, dislocate their coccyx. And if it stays out of alignment, <clears throat> that can be difficult for uh, labor. So uh, sometimes folks get that put back into place. How or when can you get it put back into place? Because I told you that story about the, how I got kicked into the air and landed on concrete. Yeah. But I birthed two babies. Yeah. Well, yours might have been fine, right? Um, sometimes they're not blocking. But if you saw like a midwife or chiropractor, uh, they could check it, right? Taylor and then Krish. Um. So when we're talking about like, the birth canals, um, is there a lot of anatomical variation between people who are sent to male birth and male birth and like how wide that is to begin with? Yeah, so yeah, basically, yes. Um, the biggest differences are this this is a assigned male at birth pelvis, and the ilia are closer this way. Mm -hmm. And um, the birth canal is smaller, so there's less of an angle here. Mm -hmm. And uh, assigned female at birth, this is wider, mm -hmm. and this is wider. It's flared more out. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's why I can tell this is a assigned male at birth model. Which is right, typical <laughs> typical sexism, right? That a lot of scientists use male, right, as the standard, right? So we have a lot of male models here. This is a male model as well. It's very small right here. And it's small here. Did they ever use the females? Yes. I mean, we certainly, we, we could, uh, your, your models are probably male too but we could look for female skeletal models. I think we need one. Yep. Uh, we guess, I'm sorry, Chris was next. The hiatus, does the spinal cord go all the way down through the hiatus of the sacrum? There is part of it, yeah. At the base, it's interesting, they call it the cauda equina, instead of one, one solid tube like here mm. at the base, it kind of separates into like hair extensions mm. uh, or cauda equina horse's tail and it becomes like uh, fanned out more like our spinal nerve roots. Mm. So they come out <clears throat> down from there? Uh, part of it, I mean, they're coming out every segment, between every segment and uh, so, just part of it comes out that way. There's also part of it that comes out the sides and around the butt. Did you have a question about? Okay. Oh, sorry. I think we, I, I don't remember if we covered this or not. But yeah. when it comes to like um, like women when they're on their uh, I, we call it the moon. Yeah. Their moon time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, are we still allowed to massage them? Are yeah, we supposed to massage them in a specific way? Yeah, great question. So the, the question is, uh, folks that are menstruating, is it okay to massage them? There are some cultures uh, where people have beliefs that it's not okay. So if that's their culture, right, that's to respect that. Um, but it's my understanding and experience uh, outside of those cultures that it actually can be very helpful. It can be very helpful for the pain, mm -hmm. it can, the cramps. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, of course, uh, folks have pain and cramps and different symptoms, right? But uh, particularly if uh, folks have more of the pain and cramps in the back, mm -hmm. the massage can be really helpful. And oftentimes the moist heat can be very helpful. Mm -hmm and massaging around the glutes and the greater trochanter and the sacrum uh, can all be very helpful. Now, it may temporarily like uh, stimulate flow of blood, but the same amount of blood needs to come out anyway. And sometimes the cramps are also related to that being stopped in the first place. So it kind of helps that flow, right? 
So is that still a part of uh, like the LGBTQ community where like uh, they're going to try to get out at first, but they're no longer uh, having a lot of their dad? Yeah. But you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does that still apply? Uh, that no longer like an effort or an issue. Right. Uh, I think the simplest way to answer that question is that it depends if they're taking hormones that change whether or not they're uh, having uh, cycles anymore. Okay. Um, so um, if if they are, then yes. And is that something we'd have to like um, like ask be like before we even do anything? Yeah. And just be aware of. Or? Yeah. Um, I think we'll have a whole unit oh, okay. on All sort right. of how to like questions to ask or what to talk about or what to know, but um, you will have in your health intake any medications the folks are taking, oh, yeah. right? And so like, for example, are they taking testosterone or hormone, hormone blockers for the younger folks? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there are questions usually about their cycles to just everybody, right? And like, um, What's that? What that is that like for them? Just anybody, right? Some folks have more um, cramping, pain, PMS, whatever. So, and is that something they want help with, right? But it comes up in a practice a lot, um, just as far as how many folks do have, right? Cramps and, and pain and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Anna and Taylor. Well, there was something I wanted to ask. Prior to this, if I can just quickly grab the abs that we were asking there um, from my body, um, it's very soothing, especially with the heat element. Yeah. That we're talking about, and massage is very soothing. Um, but also, uh, pain tolerance is a little different sometimes. That I know I have experienced during my period that pain in general, it could be on my finger, but especially around this region, is a little more heightened. Uh, everything feels more sensitive to the body to me during that time. And, you know, and that relates to emotional stuff too, um, with the hormone fluctuation. So I just wanted to add that. So um, being more gentle, I think. Especially around that area. Sometimes, like, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, right? Because it, again, I think it brings up sort of like what kind of questions to ask, right? Because mm -hmm. sometimes folks are more, uh, need more gentle, but uh, sometimes, right, like the sort of more deeper releases around the sacrum and glutes and so forth can help quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I used to get bad cramps and that used to help me a lot as, mm -hmm. as did many of my clients, right? Um, I'm both postmenopausal and taking testosterone, so it's not an issue for me anymore. But um, yeah, Taylor. Well, I was just going to say for me personally, I take testosterone, and so for me personally, I don't have like a monthly cycle, but I do sometimes experience still like cramping, like at what would be my yeah. time of month, but isn't, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I know. Obviously, everybody has very different experiences with like how hormones affect their body. And so, some people who take testosterone might still have um, a monthly cycle, while others may not. So, I think as Seth was saying earlier, it feels like more about like how to do those intake questions in a way that like, yeah. gets to what you need to know about that specific person. Mm -hmm. Just that there's a lot of variation. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing and thank you for the questions. It's amazing how the hormones can make so much variation and how the massages are used. Well, and right, that's going on, right, with all the clients at all times, yeah. right? Uh, everybody's having their hormone experiences. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I did have a different question, though. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about, uh, was that or the sacral hiatus? Yeah. And the nerves coming down. So, where does the um, oh shoot, I forgot what it's called the big nerves that go over your boots? Sciatic yeah, nerve. Sciatic nerve. Where do those lead into? 
I think I might have a picture mm -hmm. of that here. Down the, the acetabular area. If we don't have good pictures here next quarter, the first thing that we're going to get deeper into is the pelvis okay. and the sacrum and the glutes. So we'll kind of come back to that, okay. kind of diving into one area at a time. This review spine is obviously very blurry. So I feel like there was maybe, yeah. Let's do the discs before lunch break. And then when we have lunch break or when we come back from lunch break, we'll be doing activities to work with all this. So we've all heard of intervertebral discs in some manner or another. Um, you know, this is what's damaged when you have uh, like, a, like a herniated disc. Um, so these discs are um, supposed to function as shock absorbers. Um, there's a lot of, you know, compacting pressure on the spine. And they should um, help be flexible with movement. So if I was to flex the spine, which would be this direction, um, there should be some squishiness or give. And if I extend the spine, there should be some squishiness and give so that this can change shapes. And we'll take a look at some nice pictures to understand that better. So here is our intervertebral disc and it has two main sections. The outer side, the annulus fibrosis is a lot stronger and harder. And the inner side is more, it's like a jelly donut. The in, inside nucleus pulposus is more squishy. Uh, but the design has these like concentric circles like tires uh, to help make it really strong. And then on the inside, like a jelly donut, we have more squishiness. And what it should do with that squishiness is it helps with the shock absorption and I don't know why these pictures aren't coming up. I don't know if they're still loading, but there were. Up on mine. Yeah, it's not on mine either. Okay. We had a couple good side pictures too that I might. Wow, they just disappeared. Strange. Okay, so I'm just going to draw like the important ones. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, this one that talks about how it's like a ball between two plates and flexion and extension. Basically, if we have this like jelly donut design, and we have a giant vertebra up here, so I'm gonna actually like keep that here. All right, from the side, and then let's say we have this intervertebral disc here, and it's like these strong circles. And then inside we have this jelly. Let's say our jelly is green. I'm going to exaggerate, but let's say, well, actually, let's say our spine is neutral. We're going to kind of have this distributed more in the middle. But if we uh, flex, and so these two sides come together, it's going to shoot that in that direction, right? And if we extend and these two sides come together, it's going to shoot it in that direction. And in an ideal situation, we've got this strong um, uh, tissue here that's going to keep it in there. But what can happen is wear and tear and damage and to the point where this jelly could shoot out. And that's what a hernia is. And it just so happens by the design, that how it usually shoots out is posterolaterally. And if it leaks out posterolaterally, what's in these spaces? Nerve. Nerve roots. So, ouch, like big time ouch. So, our nerve roots come out here. And if it presses on our nerve roots, we can have sharp shooting pain. People can be just like crawling around there in so much pain. Did you say what the jelly, that's called again? You just called it 
Uh, the inside is a nucleus pulposus. I'll go back to that slide. And the outside is an annulus fibrosus. And it's actively connected to the bodies of the spine? Yes, the annulus fibrosus is uh, connected to it directly. Yep. Yep. And, but in general, like whatever movement you're doing, the whole thing is designed for shock absorption. And because there's so much more pressure on the low back, that's why this is the segment that tends to get those herniations the most common, yeah. Um, we'll get into pathologies of the spine later. This is just a preview. So let's see if we're, Missing anything? Do, 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 do. And uh, again, we'll come back to dermatomes in the nervous system, but but basically, the idea is that these nerve roots come out between the intervertebral foramen all the way top to bottom, and the different segments innervate different sections of the body. And there's incoming signals and outgoing signals. And so, you know, we can, um, if, if, if one nerve root is really damaged, we'll see damage in the area either from what that area is sensing or what that area is doing output signals to. Okay. Just a teeny bit more on these facet joints. I already talked about, you know, these joints a bit, but yeah, we already talked about how, you know, there's these different facet joints from the top and the bottom. They allow the different movement, depends which direction they're facing, how much they can do. And then I don't need you to memorize these movements uh, at this point, uh, but this diagram is just kind of indicating like the different amount of movement possible in each section of the spine. So here we have like 35 degrees of our lateral flexion is possible in our cervical, 20 and 20 from lumbar and thoracic with a total of 75 degrees of lateral flexion. Yeah, yeah. And when we come back, second quarter to postural assessment, we'll look at the different uh, ranges of motions again. But that's just kind of an example. And uh, in in general, you know, the the cervical area is the most uh, mobile, then thoracic, and then the least mobile is uh, lumbar, with variations, of course, with each movement. And then this next part I started to talk about already because of scoliosis, but we will get into that later with scoliosis. So last but not least are the ligaments. And I don't need you to memorize every single ligament, but if you could start to visualize some of the arrangement here on the spine. So uh, the ligaments prevent excessive motion. So they stabilize the spine. And they are, um, they're quite similar to this sort of, um, you know, this uh, exercise kind of tape or stretchy stuff. Usually I have scissors here and I don't. Um, so. Yeah, could you get me one, please? Thank you very much. So here we're looking at just a couple segments. Thank you very much. I'm not gonna make a complete model, but I just wanna uh, make a partial model to talk about the basic lay of the land here with ligaments. Um, these ligaments are preventing excessive movement. So if I was to put ligaments on the anterior of the body, these would prevent too much extension. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. But I would also want to place them where they would prevent too much flexion. So in general, I'm going to need them on this side to prevent too much flexion. And I'm going to want to prevent too much rotation. I'm going to want to prevent too much lateral flexion. 
<laughs> and so on. <clears throat> so basically, is the spine protected on all four sides of, with ligaments? Basically, yeah. Okay. But because of its interesting shapes and design, yeah. that ends up being a little different, right? So, for example, you can see we have this one right all the way in the middle of the tunnel. And that's one of the ones preventing um, the movement. We have them between each segment. We have them between each transverse process. We have them on the entire spinous processes. We have them between each of the spinous processes and we have them around all of the facet joints. So really in all different directions but they're each preventing different excessive movement, protecting the spine. And I am gonna just call out one of them because it's one that came up for one of our muscles already. And that is, um, do you remember the part of the trapezius that attached to the spinous processes in cervical, what that was called? Ligamentum nuca. Beautiful. Nuca ligament or ligamentum nuca. That is basically just the name of the ligament on the spinous processes in the cervical area. But we have that same arrangement all the way down. Yeah. So, and that's going to prevent too much flexion, right? Can you see that? Cool. Questions? All right, you're doing a great job. That's a lot of information. Yeah. You may not remember that when we first started the shoulder girdle, it was also a lot of information and we'll spend time now with it to help you make some sense of it. And I'm not gonna make you memorize the name of all the ligaments in the spine, but this is just kind of showing, right? Like which excessive movements uh, the, the different ligaments prevent, so. On the test, the final test, do they go over questions about the spine and how they look and stuff like that? Uh, I would expect questions, all kinds of questions about the spine and uh, bony landmarks and so forth, but not so much about the ligaments, right? In general, what the ligaments do, but not the names of every single one of them. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Huh? I think so. You think so? Okay. The last thing is that we do the muscles group by group. So starting next week, uh, we're gonna look deeper into the muscles, but these are the little preview, the rotatories and multifida I told you about in the lamina groove. And then we get to the, uh, we don't need the details of that yet. And then as we get to the longer crossing muscles like the erector spinae, and again, we'll get into those more next week in the quadratus lumborum, so forth. And then we just did a cursory look at spinal cord and the nerve roots. We'll come back to these in the nervous system. We don't need to get so deep with that right now. The quadratus lumborum, I think you said, was like the levator scapula. 